Please open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll uh, get a running start with verse number 1, but our focus this morning will be verses 6 through 8. But 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1 is where we will start. At Balfour, we affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now last week we looked at verses 1 through 5, which focuses on the church responding to immorality for the sake of the sinning member. This week we'll look at verses 6 through 8, which focuses on the church responding to immorality for the sake of the purity of the church. When confronted with unrepentant sin in the church, should the church prioritize the sinning member or the purity of the church? The answer is yes. The answer is both. We must do both. There was nothing easy about the text that we looked at last week. There's nothing easy about the text that we're going to look at this week. As I said last week, the church often miscounts the cost of addressing sin, believing the cost to be far greater to address the sin and believing the cost to be far less to ignore the sin. The cost of silence, the cost of failing to respond, has been and will be far greater for both the individual and for the church. And regardless of the perceived or the experienced cost, faithfulness to God and obedience to His Word is always the right decision. We have seen and are seeing firsthand the destructive cost of sexual immorality. It's been brought into the church. It's bringing two individuals in the church We have experienced and are experiencing firsthand the destructive cost sexual immorality has brought and is bringing to our church family as a whole. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you are a rock. I thank you, God, that you are an ever-present help in time of trouble. God, I thank you that you are a refuge and a strength. God, I thank you that you are our shepherd. God, I pray that as we open up your word this morning, God, as we, as we come face to face with the word of the living God, uh, that we would understand how you have called your church to live. God, help us to come face to face with the Savior who died for our sins in order that we might be saved from them. And God, help us to trust more and more on your Spirit as we seek to walk by faith and not by sight. God, I thank you that you would call such a weak person to your pulpit to preach your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would make your strength perfect in my weakness God, I pray that you would get all the honor and the glory and the praise for everything that is said and done this morning. God, please open our eyes that we might see wondrous things from your law. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 5. We'll start at verse 1, go through verse 8. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you were gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan, For the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. 
Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's look to the Bible this morning with ears to hear and a heart to obey. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to your Bible there in verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Webster's 1828 defines glorying as a display of pride, boasting. If you look back at verse 2, the church had been described as being puffed up, a term used by Webster, defined by Webster, as inflated with vanity and pride. The first four chapters of 1 Corinthians paint the picture of a church that considered itself quite spiritual. The word translated puffed up is used seven times in the New Testament. Six of those times is here in 1 Corinthians. The church in Corinth had an issue with pride. The church in Corinth was puffed up by knowing right doctrine and by speaking right doctrine, yet by giving little to no attention to practicing right doctrine. They were ignoring sexual immorality among them. The church at Corinth had no reason to boast of being spiritually mature. And I want you to notice the word good there in verse number 6. Paul had three Greek adjectives that he could have chosen from for that word that's translated good in verse 6. The Holy Spirit did not inspire Paul to choose the word that meant beneficial. The Holy Spirit didn't inspire him to choose the word that meant pleasant. The Holy Spirit inspired him to choose the word that meant ethically good. What they were doing was wrong. Now, Consider how easy it is to become puffed up individually and glory in what we believe is our own spiritual maturity. We can look around the church and say to ourselves, I am more spiritually mature than that man or than that woman. Consider how easy it is to become puffed up as a church and glory in what we believe is our church's spiritual maturity. We can look down the road at a church and we can say to ourselves, we stick much closer to the Bible than that church does. Our standard of holiness is not the Christian we share a pew with or the church down the road. The Bible does not say, be holier than The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy holy. Our standard is not holier than. Our standard is be holy for our God is holy. Look to the Bible, verse 6. The church's refusal to address the sexual immorality of the professing Christian who assembled with this church was affecting the entire church. Look at verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul is not making or excuse me Paul is making a statement here in the form of a question. The church should have known this. Paul spent the first 18 months of the church at Corinth's existence teaching the word of God to them. Leaven 
is defined in the Davis Dictionary of the Bible as a substance used to produce fermentation in the dough and make it rise. In Scripture times, leaven generally consisted of a little old dough in a high state of fermentation. Now in the Bible, when we see the word leaven, it's generally used to describe that which is evil, that which is sinful. Now Paul is not giving us instructions here in verse 6 on how to make bread. Now just as when Jesus equated leaven with the doctrine of the Pharisees, what they taught, warning them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Paul is equating leaven with the sexual immorality in the church. He's warning them the leaven is affecting all of them. Now look at the word there in verse 6, leavens. The Bible says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leavens is in the present tense. The leaven was affecting the lump of dough. The leaven would continue to affect the lump of dough. Once it started, it did not stop until it was removed. Allow me to make a a brief observation here as we consider old dough being mixed with new dough. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Then look what the Bible says in the very next verse. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What wonderful words there in the Scriptures. And such were some of you. The church of Corinth was comprised of sinners who God had saved by grace. It was made up of folks that God had washed, that He had sanctified, and that He had justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The church at Balfour is comprised of sinners that God has saved by grace through faith. Having been washed, having been sanctified and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. When Jesus saves a sinner, the saved sinner becomes a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Some of the members of the church at Corinth had formerly been sexually immoral. Then God saved them from sexual immorality. Now, Sexual morality was being brought back into the church, and it was infecting the church. Remember, Jesus did not come merely to save us from the consequences of our sins. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Now, we may have some difficulty in our modern culture understanding leaven, and how it was permeated through a loaf of bread in biblical times, how they would use the old dough. And and we may not quite understand how that concept works, how how this concept of leaven was infecting the church. Well, Paul's shown us right here in the text it was the sin of sexual immorality. Perhaps we're here today and we say, well, you know what? It's just a little leaven. What can a little leaven do? hurt in an entire lump of dough. Now what if we swapped the word leaven with the word cancer? What if we swapped those two words? And the doctor said to you, you have cancer. Would you look at the doctor and say to him, well, it's just a little cancer. What can it hurt? Of course not. You'd say to your doctor, let's get it out as fast as possible before it spreads 
to my whole body. Sin spreads through a church like cancer. A church that will not address the sin of sexual immorality among its members will most certainly look past other sins. A church cannot pick and choose which sins it's going to address among the membership. The first line, the first line of defense against sin here in Balfour is for you and I not to bring it in. My sin affects me, it affects my family, and it affects all of you. Your sin affects you, it affects your family, and it affects all of us. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 8 and 10, that if we, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Look to the Bible, verse 7. Here we see how the church must respond when sin is present. Therefore, purge out the old leaven. This is a command given to the church. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. There was an impurity in this local church, and God was commanding the church to clean it out. We make an observation here about purging out the old leaven. Everyone who names the name of Christ is to depart iniquity. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 20-21, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for dishonor and some, or excuse me, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. The word cleanses there in 2 Timothy 2.21 is the same word translated purged out in 1 Corinthians 5.7. If I desire to see God work in my life, I'm kidding myself if I think he will do so while I remain in unrepentant sin. If you desire God to work in your life, you're kidding yourself if you think he will do so while you remain in unrepentant sin. If we as a church desire God to work in the life of this church, we are kidding ourselves if we do so while ignoring unrepentant sin. Can you imagine a person being diagnosed with cancer and telling their doctor, saying, Doctor, please don't get all of it out. I'd like you to leave just a little bit of cancer in. Of course not. Just as a cancer patient desires all of the cancer to be removed from his or her body, a Christian should desire all of the sin be removed out of his or her life. A church should desire all of the sin removed out of the church. Now we know as sinful human beings, this won't be accomplished fully till we get to heaven. But it should not stop us from making it our aim here on earth. The desire of our heart should be that we would be well-pleasing to God. Look to your Bible, verse 7. Here we see why the church should purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. Notice there in the text, the Bible doesn't say lumps. The word lump is singular. Now it may not be the most flattering description given in Scripture of the church, but we are one lump of dough. So we're described here in the text. Now notice the phrase, since you truly are unleavened. 
The original language is there, unleavened is plural. Paul is describing the Christians who make up the lump. So if you think about each one of us as a part of a collective lump of dough. Paul began this letter with a series of wonderful descriptions of the church at Corinth. These descriptions can apply to the, any believer of our, our position in Christ. They were sanctified in Christ Jesus. They were called to be saints. The grace of God had been given to them by Christ Jesus. They were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge. The testimony of Christ was confirmed in them so that they would come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus would also confirm them to the end, that they may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were called into the fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So we look back at verse 7, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. The clear instructions to the church in Corinth, and to the church at Balfour, in verse 7 is this. Be who God has set you apart to be. That's what God is calling His church to be. Be who God has set us apart to be. A Christian choosing sin instead of pursuing holiness is fighting against the will of God for their life. A church being a shelter for sin instead of a sanctuary for the saved to pursue holiness together is fighting against the will of God. Now, let me speak to the faithful Christian for a moment. Those who are making it your aim to be well-pleasing to God. I want you to imagine for a moment... A poor sinner, on his way to hell, walks in to this church. And he says, you know, I had read the Bible, and it said that I must repent and believe in the gospel. This poor sinner walks in, he says, I have read in the Bible that I must enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So this poor sinner walks in, and he says, you know, I read those things in the Bible, but then I came to Balfour, and they showed me that the road is actually wide. They showed me that I can live any way I want to live. I didn't have to forsake my sin, they showed me that as long as I prayed a prayer, I could keep my sins with me. All I had to do was pray a prayer. I never knew the Christian life was so easy. Let that not be said of us, church. We must be who God has set us apart to be. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 12, and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Now, imagine for a moment a poor sinner on his or her way to hell, walks in this church and sees a group of people walking faithfully in obedience to God. Not perfectly, but faithfully. A group of people making it our aim to be well-pleasing to God. This poor sinner walks in and he sees a group of people who have been washed, who have been sanctified, who were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. 
And this poor sinner that's walked in and he's seen this. And he says, this gospel, this gospel that this church talks about, it must truly be the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Because the God that these people love, He has transformed them. He is transforming them. Now look to your Bible, verse number 7. Here we see how the church had become unleavened. They had been bought at a price. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Now, as Paul has discussed leaven and unleavened in verses 6 and 7, anyone with familiarity with the Old Testament would have thought back to the Passover feast the Jews observed. To give a, a brief overview, the opening pages of the book of Exodus describe a time when the Jews were enslaved in Egypt. God raised up a prophet named Moses to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. God brought a series of plagues upon the Egyptians. Each one demonstrated his superiority over the false gods the Egyptians worshipped. Yet Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. The Lord explained to Moses that he would go through the land of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt would die. The Lord then explained the steps the Israelites were to take. They were to take a lamb on the tenth day of the month. It was to be without blemish. They were to kill it at twilight on the fourteenth day of the month. They were to take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. They were to eat the flesh on that night roasted in fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Then the Lord said in Exodus 12, 12 and 13, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Let's focus for just a moment here on the lamb. Look at verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. The Passover was not an end in and of itself. The Passover pointed toward Christ. It pointed to Jesus who is Emmanuel, God with us. It pointed to the one who was born of a virgin 2,000 years ago. The one who came to save his people from their sins. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Let me just say it once again. Christ died for your sins. Have you received Him as your Savior and Lord? If you have not, and you do not, you will spend eternity in hell being judged for your sins. 
The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now what if you're here today and you're saying to yourself, well, he wasn't speaking to me just then. I prayed a prayer. I've been baptized. Yet there is sin in your life that you have no desire to repent of. There is sin in your life that you are presently pursuing. And an honest assessment of your life against the Scriptures is that your life is marked by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If that describes you, then let me just say, you are sitting here this morning in grave danger. And I plead with you, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith, if you have that desire for sin in place of Christ. You see, if we profess Christ while pursuing sin, where do we find any assurance of salvation? We certainly don't find it in the Bible if we profess Christ and continue in a pursuit of sin. It's just not there. You won't find assurance in the Scriptures if you profess Christ yet pursue sin. Before moving to verse 8, let me speak once again to the faithful Christian for a moment. Christ was sacrificed for me. Christ was sacrificed for you. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. I spent a lot of time this week thinking about what Christ did for me. About what Christ did for each and every one of us dying for our sins. Dying to save me from my sins. To borrow an image that we see in Hebrews 10. As I began to think about Christ dying for my sins. And I began to think about all the different temptations we face in the world and even in our own carnal, fleshly heart. I began to envision myself. Anytime I were to take a step towards sin, anytime I were to take steps in sin, I began to imagine myself as trampling on the blood of Christ as I did that. Now think, think about that picture for just a moment. As I walk towards sin, as you walk towards sin, as I walk in sin, as you walk in sin, can you picture yourself doing that? as you carelessly stomp on the blood of Jesus, the very blood He shed to save us from our sins. That causes me to pause and evaluate the decisions I make. Is this well-pleasing to God? I don't want to go and stomp and trample over the blood of Christ and sin. He shed that for me. That should cause each one of us, those who indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us, we should think about that as we see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We're tempted to walk toward it. We're trampling over the shed blood of Christ as we do. So look to verse 8. Here we see the church's response to Christ's sacrifice. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The mood of the verb keep in the Greek indicates that a choice or decision would need to be made. We can see that in the text. They could either keep the feast or they could not keep the feast. The Israelites were to observe the Passover feast as a means of remembrance that God had redeemed them from the bondage of Egyptian slavery. The word keep 
is in the present tense. It indicates an ongoing state of life. It means not simply on the Sundays that we observe the Lord's Supper, not simply on Sundays when we assemble for worship. It means each day, each moment of each day. The Christian has a choice to live, celebrating, remembering that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And just as you look back and you see the ordinances given to the Israelites concerning the Passover meal, they didn't get to determine how the feast was to be kept. God prescribed it. We don't get to determine how the feast is to be kept. God prescribes it. Notice how we are to keep the feast. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Vines defines malice as badness and quality. It's the opposite of excellence. Malice is part of the old leaven that needs to be purged out. Vine defines wickedness as evil. Webster's goes and identifies it as departure from the rules of the divine law. Wickedness is part of that old leaven that must be purged out. It's the old way of doing things before you were made a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Israelite wanting to keep the feast with old leaven was the Israelite who desired a return to Egypt. Not the one who was yearning for Canaan. Look to the Bible, verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Vines define sincerity as pure, that which is unmixed. Think about it as what you see is what you get. Not cleaning up the outside of the cup while the inside of the cup remains filthy. Webster's 1828 defines truth as conformity to fact or reality. Vines emphasizes the truth of Christian doctrine. So we're to live with sincerity and truth. We're to live the way God has prescribed us to live. Again, going back to the point earlier, we are to live the way God has set us apart to live. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Church, we don't need to try to bring the sin of Egypt with us as we march to Canaan. The church that accepts immorality gives a poor witness. Those who are born again have been made new according to the Scriptures. The poor sinner who walks in and sees immorality among us, well, he'll say, these folks live just the same way I do. I must have been born again and didn't even know it. Now, church, as we close here, let me just say, I hope you know I'm not preaching at you. I'm not even preaching to you. I am preaching to us. We're a family. We're a collective family here. And as, as I said earlier, it may not be flattering, but we're a lump of dough. That is what we are. And I hope I have demonstrated to you, and I hope I am demonstrating to you, that I'm not one of those pastors who stays at a church until he runs out of sermons and things get hard. And then he goes and repeats the process at a church down the road. It's the desire of my heart, church, that we see these things through. And I pray it's the will of the church and the desire of the church that we see these things through together. We're a family. I want to see God 
glorified in this church. The only way we see that is by going about and doing things His way. Walking in faithful obedience to His Word. Walking in faithful dependence upon His Spirit. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 14-16, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's take this opportunity that we have, church, to pray, to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So as the piano plays, you do just that. Pray in the pew. Pray here at the altar. Go find someone to pray with. Whatever you do, just pray to our Father in heaven. Our Father and our God, Lord, you are holy. God, thank you in your holiness and your righteousness and your justice, Lord, that you did not set those aside in order to be loving and merciful. Lord, you do not diminish any of your attributes for the sake of another. Lord, but in your loving righteousness, you demanded payment for sin, and you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, that we might believe in him and be made born again, made new creations. God, I pray if there's anyone here who's dead in their sin, Lord, that today would be the day they would look to Jesus Christ and be saved. And God, I pray for your church. God, I pray that, that you would give us the will and the desire, Lord, to live as you have set us apart to live. Lord, to live as, as you have made us, as you have designed us. Lord, let not one Christian here Seek to live in opposition to you, Lord, but to, to live with you, to live alongside of you, to dwell and abide, Lord, as the Scriptures teach. Lord, help us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is you who work in us both to will and to do for your good pleasure. God, I pray you'd keep us strong or keep us close to you, keep us walking by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name. Amen.